joined now by a man who won 318 games at the Major League level, made five All-Star appearances, claimed five Gold Glove awards, and is one of just two knuckleball pitchers to be enshrined at the National Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown, New York, Phil Necro. Phil, how are you today? Hey, I'm well, man. Thank you. Nice to talk with you. Nice to talk with you. You know, it's clear the Atlanta Braves organization means a lot to you. So let's go back to 1992. The Atlanta Braves had asked you to come out and pitch batting practice to some of their hitters in an effort to solve Tim Wakefield in that year's National League Championship Series. Was there ever a moment's hesitation to help the club in that situation? And what do you remember about that time? Any conversations with Bobby Cox or Brave players? I mean, I remember Terry Pendleton started hitting right-handed. He was a switch hitter. He only hit right-handed against Wakefield in, the, in some hope of finding a way to hit him. So what do you remember about that whole situation? Well, at the time, I was in San Diego, well, uh, in Santa Monica with my wife visiting uh, friends out there, and John Charles called me and uh, wanted to know if I would come down to a batting practice. I said, well, I'm in Santa Monica, California right now. He said, well, if we fly you out tomorrow morning, would you come down there the next day and throw BP? We got Wakefield pitching tonight against us, and our players are a little confused about how to approach him, so... I flew down and I went out to batting practice that evening. I think I threw a shutout against him during batting practice, <laughs> I think. And then Terry Pellant was asking me and uh, some other guys would ask me how to approach it, what size bat, what weight, the length. And, you know, I really didn't have much of an answer for them because I never hit off of it very much. I threw it. I, I did hit one home run off of Charlie Huff and got a few hits off my late brother Joe. But as far as telling them the correct way to hit a knuckleball, you know, I, I really, I really just couldn't do that. So mm -hmm. they were, they were kind of confused. A lot of players asking me, you know, what to look for, how to approach, and I just say, hey, go up there and see the ball and hit the ball. Don't, don't think so much of it as, a, as a knuckleball, because you start thinking knuckleballs and you get that mentality in your head that, oh, gee, what's it going to do? So mm -hmm. I, I just informed a few guys. I said, just, just, just think of it as a breaking ball. Every knuckleball he's going to throw you, every pitch he's going to throw you is going to be a breaking ball, and that will take the knuckleball mentality out of your head. So that's how I told him to approach it. Mm -hmm. You brought up your brother, Joe Negro. You guys teamed to win 539 games, the most by brothers in Major League history. Of course, after being caught with an emery board and tossed from a game in 1987, he made a famous appearance on the David Letterman show where Letterman asked him if he doctored the ball, and Joe's response was, do I look like a doctor to you? How much fun did the two of you have with that Thanksgiving that year? I mean, how much fun did you have with that whole situation, him being on a national television broadcast like that? Well, Joe was on it. I wasn't, but I, you know, I, I really never got any fun out of it, and I think Joe maybe a little bit, but a little bit. But if you look at that, and, and I'm sure if you see replays and, and saw how that was done, mm -hmm. you know, a, a picture yourself landing on the mound, uh, with 30,000 people out there, uh, four umpires, two coaches, first base and third posing team, cameras on you, probably five of them. You're standing on a mile with an emery board in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Explain to me, or someone explain to me, how you could take that emery board out of your back pocket on the mound and scuff the ball with it. I've always wondered that. Because I've never seen video, even when people get thrown out in games where they've been, you know, accused of doctoring the ball, I've never seen them actually do anything. And from what I understand with knuckleballers, emery boards, and that kind of thing, uh, filing your nails down is something that's very important for a knuckleball pitcher, right? Well, I, I've done a lot. I've carried in my back pocket. I always just did a dugout. Uh, but if you, if you maybe call a timeout and explain to the umpire maybe what you're doing and walk off the mound, mm -hmm. put the emery board back in there, well, you know, maybe umpires got the ball, but there's just absolutely no possible way you could do that on the mound. And, and when they came out and checked you, he was a little upset about it, and he, threw, he just threw the memory board away. And, of course, when they see him hit the ground, they threw him out of the game. But right. they would have had a handcuff me to take me off that mound because <laughs> unless you can show me proof somehow that I used that emery board to doctor that ball up on the mound during the game, then you got me other than that we got a problem with it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you stop to reflect back on your career, 300 wins, the All-Star appearances, gold gloves, a pair of trips to the postseason, how does it feel to know that of all the knuckleballers in baseball history, only Hoyt Wilhelm and yourself are enshrined at Cooperstown? Well, you know, there wasn't too many of them throwing it. If you look back over the history of the game, mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, you know, 
know, investigate how many guys threw it uh, as a number one pitch. You're not going to find too many that did that. There are a few that kind of mixed it in with other pitches, but, you know, a true knuckleballer is going to go out there and just throw it every pitch. He knows he knows that the batter knows what's coming, and, you know, he's got enough confidence to throw it. And, you know, and, and that was my whole career. If I didn't have a knuckleball, I, I probably wouldn't have never even got to the minor leagues with it. So I was very fortunate and blessed to be able to play that long, some 23 years in the, in the big leagues. And, Never had any arm problems, surgery, so I was able to go out there every four days back in those days in five. And you go out there that many times, you got a chance to win a lot of ball games, and you got a chance to lose a lot of ball games, which I also did. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you played eight years with Dale Murphy in Atlanta, and then for one start in 1987. Having saw him play day in and day out for nearly a decade, do you feel he belongs enshrined alongside you at the Hall of Fame? I mean, if you look at some stats, he's as close as just uh, as close or better than a couple other guys in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he's on that borderline right now. Uh, he just doesn't seem to get the votes, and I don't know why. But for me, he, he was the best athlete, best baseball player, other than Hank Aaron, that I played with. Uh, him and Don Magny up with, with, with the uh, Yankees, and he, he's on that, on that fence line, too. There's a lot of guys right on the fence line that go either way. If they don't get a certain amount of votes, of course, they drop off the list and it goes to the Veterans Committee. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to his name, I'm going to I'm gonna really promote him and, and, and see if I can get some other guys to realize what he did. Mm -hmm. You know, the knuckleball fraternity is a very tight one. When I spoke with Charlie Huff about a week ago, he said that when you run into trouble or you're struggling, those are the only people you can turn to, the ones who've gone through the same difficulties throwing the same pitch. So I'm wondering, how often do you get a call from someone like R.A. Dick, your young pitchers looking for advice or guidance on throwing the knuckleball or who want to start throwing the knuckleball? Well, I get a lot of letters, especially letters, uh, wanting me to teach them how to throw a knuckleball with a letter, which is impossible. Right. I, I work with Tim Wakefield when uh, the Red Sox got him when he got released in Pittsburgh. I worked with him for a couple, two, three years. We'd go to spring training, fly up to Boston during the season when he felt like he needed some help. Worked a little bit with R.A. Dickey. Charlie Huff had the most influence, I think, on R.A. Dickey. Mm -hmm. uh, worked with a couple of knuckleball pitches at the Baltimore Oregon uh, minor league system. Uh, but there are just not too many of them out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, scouts aren't out there looking for knuckleball pitchers. But if you've got a good one, you're young. I mean, it, it, it can get you to the minor leagues and possibly the big leagues. There just aren't enough knuckleball teachers out there. and. Everyone's telling these young boys, you know, you're not going to get to the big leagues with a knuckleball. They're looking for hard throwers, so every year to try is pump up and throw hard and good sliders, and a lot of guys can't do that, so it's it's an avenue to get there. But you you got to really commit to it. you got to really, really commit to the knuckleball and forget about your fastballs and sliders and change-ups. It's just knuckleball, 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 and start getting that thing over the plate, then you can maybe mix in a slide or something. But, you know, when you want to become a knuckleball pitcher, you got to really make that commitment, that sacrifice, that that's all you're going to throw, pitch after pitch, and, and, and just keep working at it. It's not going to come over a night in a week or two. You know, I was still trying to figure it out when I retired, you know, <laughs> when I was 48. <laughs> You squared off with Don Sutton on June 28, 1986, which was more than a duel between future Hall of Famers. It marked the first time since 1892 that each team's starting pitcher had won 300 games. What did such a lofty number as 94 years mean to you before, during, and after that game? Uh, really not much of anything. I, I didn't even know that going into the game. I, I've heard that once or twice after that game, it was just, a game that I was scheduled to pitch. It was a game that he was scheduled to pitch, and we went out there and, and, and tried to win our ball games. But I, I didn't look at it as any particular special game. No, in no way. All right. You managed the Colorado Silver Bullets female baseball team for a time. What led you to embark on that journey? And after all these years, what sticks with you when you look back on that experience? Well, I, I was retired, and, and a young man out of Bob Hope who used to be in the Braves. Uh, front office called me and told me if I would manage a women's baseball team. And the first thing came to my mind was, I don't know if women play baseball. 
I know they play softball all over the country, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I know we're going to play against men from all over the country, and Coors Brewing Company is going to sponsor us. And I said, I don't know. Let me think about it. So I talked to my wife, and I, I talked to my sister Phyllis. He used to catch my knuckleball in the backyard when I was growing <laughs> up, and a couple other people. They said, Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know, you know, uh, your name may may help get in there. So. Uh, I, I signed a contract and uh, got my brother Joe to be the pitching coach. My son John helped out as a assistant on the ball club. Traveled all over the country. We went to uh, did you really go not China but uh, somewhere to play. Uh, played against men's teams all over the year, all over, all over the country. Won I think four games the first year. Played four our last year was a, it was a winning season. The thing I remember about that is is. First of all, the young ladies got a chance to play baseball, and uh, which has never been done before, I don't think, in this country against men. Uh, it wasn't a, a league. It was more of a barnstorming type of a thing. But, mm -hmm. boy, those young ladies played hard. And uh, I was surprised how well uh, that some of them played. They were good softball players. You know, mm -hmm. uh, The trouble they had was uh, bat speed, power. But uh, we had some young ladies could pitch. We had defense was excellent, run the bases. It, it just took them a while to get out of that softball mode that they've been into since probably grade school and high school and, and put them on a mound, which is 60 feet in the base or 90. We're, now we're playing in baseball fields with, you know, 335 left field fences and 400 center field. Mm -hmm. Hit pop-ups I've never seen before. Uh, Curveballs and fastballs overhand and Lefties pick them off of first base. Catchers couldn't throw to second base when we started the relays. So it was, it was a it was a big project to get through. But I I really really enjoyed that four years. And I was really proud of the way they approached the game. Uh, I was just sorry that Coors Brewing Company just kind of decided to put their money someplace else. But uh, I've still got players calling and saying, Hey, any chance we're going to get back? There's some good players out there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I would like to see someone, uh, you know, start that program up again. I'd, I'd be more than happy to get involved in it and put some money behind it and a, a good company and advertise them. It, w it would work. We sold out in every minor league ballpark we went to. I think we played nine big league stadiums. Had a lot of people come see us, so it was quite an experience. Hmm. You know, it's still summer, but it's never too early to plan ahead. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the Phil Necro Golf Classic you have scheduled for October? Actually, I, I, I have kind of two. One is my 18th year coming up. That's for a, uh, a, a children's uh, children's center here in Gainesville, Georgia. It's Abuse Children's Center. Uh, we started 18 years ago with an old rundown house, and now we have built a state-of-the-art uh, a center where an FBI, GBI, Georgia police, everybody can come in and and uh, interview the young children and their parents and grandparents and anyone who's abused these children behind hidden cameras. We have special experts doing this work and uh, trying to find these, these, you know what, I can't tell you what I call these people, but, right. you know, I take them to court and, you know, stick them in a jail and throw away the key as I look at them. But the other one I've really got involved in it is a, is a organization called Operation One Voice. It's uh, uh, it's a program that we raise money for to to assist and support the families and the troops of the special operations forces all over the country. And we fly the, the guys in, uh, fly a lot of their widows in and their children, and we have uh, we golf with them, we fish with them, and all the money is raised goes into uh, Operation One Voice. That was started right down the road here in Duluth by some firemen and, and ex-policemen, and uh, then we try and take care of them as much as we can. I mean, it's it's quite an organization. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to know about that, they go to Operation One Voice dot org on their computer and find out what we've been doing. I've hooked up with a fellow named Morton Anderson, who is still the all-time leading a score in NFL place kicker and mm -hmm. he got involved in it and uh, he's doing it too so I, I'm very proud of that one I'm, I'm really committed to that one. All right, definitely sounds like a worthwhile endeavor so uh, Phil Necro we really appreciate taking a few minutes to talk with us this morning thank you.
Oh, you're quite welcome. Good to talk to you, man. All right. Take care. Okay, bye.